In times of great blessing, it's easy to be complacent. When things are going well, we may inadvertently become less dependent upon God and more confident in self. And although COVID has been so limiting for us, we still live very comfortable lives. In Australia, we are so very blessed. So I thought we might take a little journey this term into and back into the book of Jeremiah to be challenged by some of the pitfalls around us, to be reminded of how serious God takes sin and God's attitude toward not only sin but toward us. So this morning we need to set the background as to why God sent his prophet Jeremiah to speak to the nation. So there's a bit of a a history lesson this morning. Twelve Hebrew tribes settled into the promised land and after some time they demanded an earthly king just like the surrounding nations had. And a king was given. It was in 975 BC that the nation was divided into two kingdoms. When Jeroboam I led the ten northern tribes to rebel against King Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. The northern kingdom was known as Israel and all of the kings who ruled over the northern kingdom were not God-fearing men. Assyria came from the north, conquered Israel in 721 BC. Most of their people were taken away into captivity. The southern kingdom was known as Judah. It was made up of just two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. And although a a few of its leaders were faithful to God, Judah too was on a downhill trajectory. Subsequently, God allowed Babylon to conquer Judah in 606 BC. Some of their leading citizens, including Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, were taken to Babylon at this time. Ten years later, when Judah rebelled against Babylon, so this is 596 BC, others including Ezekiel were taken as captives to Babylon. And finally, another ten years later, 586 BC, the army of Babylon returned to utterly destroy Jerusalem. Solomon's temple was torn down. Most of the remaining people were taken to Babylon. It was during Judah's last days that Jeremiah served as God's spokesman to the people, to the nation. And although the Hebrew people and their kings were determined to go their way, God kept calling them back to himself through his prophets. Imagine if you've been a Christian for a while, you've experienced that. You've experienced that from God. Determined to go your own way, yet time and time again, you've known and you've sensed God's calling you back to himself, God's prompting. He's spoken to you through his word, perhaps through another Christian, perhaps through a Sunday message. You have heard or felt the prompting of the Holy Spirit God calling you back to to himself. We ignore his voice at our own peril. God, however, remains faithful. Can you also see how God has had his hand upon you in your life, maybe even before you acknowledged him, maybe even before you became aware of him? He had his hand on you. Jeremiah was born around 650 BC. His father was Hilkiah, a priest. His home, a village about seven kilometres north of Jerusalem. He was very young when he was called by God to be a prophet. And he was not a poor man. He owned property. He had a personal secretary. God told Jeremiah not to marry or to have a family. Jeremiah's name shows that he was chosen by God, for his name means Jehovah has appointed. 
Jeremiah knew that he was called, that he was appointed by God. God had had his hand upon him even from birth. Now, although he was called by God to be God's spokesman, from an earthly perspective, his life was not a very good one. Called by God, but his life was on earth was not all that good. He wasn't successful in turning the people back to God. His own family rejected him. He was beaten and put in prison on several occasions. He was exiled by Egypt, to Egypt by Johanan, the son of Korea, after he defeated the people. The people in Jerusalem, they took things into their own hand. They killed Gedaliah, and Gedaliah was Babylon's governor over Judah at the time, and so he was exiled, along with a number of others, to Egypt. He continued to preach God's word in Egypt and according to Jewish history, he was stoned to death by his compatriots, by his fellow Jews. His life on earth was not a pleasant one. Although a child of God and even when called into a special and specific ministry, this doesn't guarantee that our earthly lives will all go well. God does have plans for us, as Jeremiah will later declare. A very well-known verse to us all. God has plans for us, but his plans are not always in line with our plans. His plans, however, always include his powerful and peaceful presence with us in spite of our circumstances. Although we may desire heaven on earth, this earth is sin-filled and suffers as a consequence. Heaven will be in heaven. Heaven is not on earth. But following Jesus is, is no guarantee for a life of ease and comfort. We need to remember too that our personal circumstances are always within the context of a much, much bigger picture involving our nation, Involving our world. Our world does not revolve around us. Again, consider Jeremiah. He's born during troubled times in world history. Great nations are struggling for control of the known world. The powerful Assyrian Empire was slowly dying. Babylon was taking over. Babylon was becoming the superpower in the north. Its army conquers Nineveh, the capital of Assyria in 612 BC. Egypt, on the other hand, to the south, has been the world power for more than a thousand years. It's striving to maintain its power against the threats that are coming from Babylon. And this little kingdom of Judah is located between these two superpowers. And on numerous occasions, these two superpowers came to war on Judah's territory. The people suffered greatly as a result. And at times, the kings of Judah, they were tempted to make alliances with either Babylon or Egypt for protection against the other. Life was unpredictable, insecure, uncertainty and fear ran rampant. Imagine living between these two superpowers. In such times there's only one place for peace and security. In the midst of COVID, in a world of turmoil, in a world where some nations appear to be stretching their military might and their economic domination. In a world filled with differing political and philosophical positions where tolerance is called for but often not given. In a world where job security is wavering. In a world where cancer is affecting more and more people, there's only one place 
for peace and security. Assurance, hope, it's in the safety of our God. Are you safely resting in the embrace of God your Father? Is the centre of your world God? I trust so. In a world of insecurity, we may be tempted to put our faith in other things. Now, Josiah was the king of Judah at the time when Jeremiah began calling the nation back to God to trust in God. Josiah sought to follow God's ways. Josiah's father, Amon, and his grandfather, Manasseh, were not faithful to God. The leaders of the nation, they flip-flopped from back and forth from trusting God and not trusting in God, ignoring God, chasing after other gods. And this morning I want to take us back to Manasseh just to see how far from God the kingdom of Judah had fallen. And there's little wonder as to why God calls upon Babylon to come and carry the Hebrew people away into exile. But even in the midst of what God's doing with Judah, and the remaining Hebrew people, we see just how gracious God is. Manasseh, he became king at the age of 12. And he ruled for 55 years. He was the longest reigning king of either Judah or Israel. Even though he came from a godly home, his dad was... was Serious about following God's ways? Even though he came from a godly home, Manasseh rebelled against God to the point of hatred. You can only, as you read Manasseh's story, you can only think that he hated God, was determined to, to say God doesn't exist. Maybe it was the loss of his father at the age of 12 Maybe it was being placed into the position of king at such an early age that embittered him. We can only presume, but whatever his father built up for God, he not only pulled it down, but he became so wicked that the Canaan nations before him had nothing on Manasseh. His evil far surpassed theirs. Although the first of the Ten Commandments was to have no other God but Yahweh, Manasseh decided to insult God to his face. And we read his story in 2 Chronicles 33 and 2 Kings 25. He rebuilt the high places his father Hezekiah had destroyed. He also erected altars to Baal and made an Asherah pole, as Ahab, king of Israel, had done. He bowed down to all the starry hosts and worshipped them. He built altars in the temple of the Lord to all of the starry hosts. He sacrificed his children to the god Moloch. In the fire in the valley of Ben-Hinnom, he practised divination and witchcraft, sought omens, consulted mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the eyes of the Lord, arousing his anger. He took the carved Asherah pole he had made and he put it in the temple. Manasseh led the people astray so that they did more evil than the nations the Lord had destroyed before the Israelites. He has led the nation to its lowest point. He not only sought and worshipped other gods, but made a mockery of the one true God. He desecrated the temple with false gods, enacting the abomination that causes desolation. Verse 16 of 2 Kings 25 says that he forced people to follow his ways, his practices, he made Jerusalem swim in the blood of those he executed who would not participate in his evil ways. Tradition says that this included the prophet Isaiah. I won't tell you what he had 
done to Isaiah. He was angry, bloodthirsty, evil, wicked man, the ruler of the nation. And this is the last straw for God. From 2 Kings again, the Lord said through his servant the prophets, Manasseh, king of Judah, has committed these detestable sins. He has done more evil than the Amorites who preceded him, and he has led Judah into sin with his idols. Therefore, I'm going to bring such disaster on Jerusalem and Judah that the ears of everyone who hears of it will tingle. I will wipe out Jerusalem as one wipes a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. I will forsake the remnant of my inheritance and give them into the hands of enemies. They will be looted, plundered by all their enemies. And God's description of what he's going to do goes on. Prior to the time when this occurs, when Jerusalem is plundered, God sends Jeremiah. And he still appeals to the people through Jeremiah. And we're going to look at God's appeal through Jeremiah over the next coming weeks. But Manasseh, for Manasseh, God is serious about sin. The Lord brought against him the army commanders of the king of Assyria who took Manasseh prisoner, put a hook in his nose, bound him with bronze shackles and took him to Babylon and there he was in prison. And we say, yes, he got his just desserts. The Lord humbled him and punished him. He got just what he deserved. Our natural bent for justice comes to the fore. We want to see those who hurt others suffer for doing such things for doing the wrong. God, on the other hand, doesn't want anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance. We read that, those exact words in 1 Peter. God doesn't want anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance. And he may orchestrate our circumstances to bring us to our knees and to seek his forgiveness. God's serious about sin. As you're praying for your loved, lost ones, are you praying that the Lord will do whatever is necessary for them to turn back to him? Whatever is necessary. And so whilst Manasseh is held in captivity with barely enough food to stay alive, we read this. In his distress, he sought the favour of the Lord his God and he humbled himself greatly before the God of his ancestors. And he prayed to him and the Lord was so moved by his entreaty and listened to his plea, so much so that he brought him back to Jerusalem and to his kingdom. What a gracious and merciful God we serve. God in his mercy forgives Manasseh his sin. He restores him back to his throne in Judah. And as you continue to read the story, Manasseh is now a God-fearing king and he is determined to return Judah to following God's ways. As his dad had done. You see, the Lord was moved by the genuine and sincere remorse that Manasseh displayed as he cried out to God. Such is the mercy of God. He saw the guilt and the shame and the sorrow in Manasseh's heart and he freely forgave him. Freely forgave. If God can forgive an evil, wicked, bloodthirsty, rebellious man like Manasseh, he can forgive you. He can forgive me. No sin is too great. Whatever you might be struggling with, God can forgive that. There's no sin that the blood of Christ cannot wash clean and make as 
white as snow. But the only way to know freedom from guilt and forgiveness and have peace in our heart is through true repentance. Genuine repentance unlocks the floodgates of God's mercy and forgiveness. God is serious about sin and he's serious about your sin and my sin. There's a price to be paid for our sin and our rebellion. Jesus has already paid the price. The wages of sin is death. Jesus died the sinner's death, although he'd never sinned, so that you and I wouldn't have to die, but rather receive eternal life. Praise God. Praise God. Encourage you today to seek the Lord for forgiveness and for salvation. Manasseh's story is an Old Testament story of conversion. A man bent on hatred toward God and rebellious through and through to becoming a child of God, following God's ways. Looking forward to meeting Manasseh in heaven? As we study Jeremiah, we'll see a faithful and loving God appealing to his people, calling them back to himself. Return to me. What an awesome, merciful God we serve. Let's pray. A gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are for your grace, for your mercy, that you would forgive a man like Manasseh, a man bent on evil and rebellion, a man who sought to to take the nation, take so many other people with him in a direction opposing you into the worship of other gods, false gods, Father, we thank you for your mercy as you forgave Manasseh. Thank you for this story that reminds us that no sin is too great for your forgiveness. Thank you that you forgive us our sin. And Father, we do pray that you would continue to guide us and lead us by your Holy Spirit, that we too would be serious about our sin, that we would be truly repentant before you, returning to you. And although this may, this doesn't guarantee us a life of comfort and ease, it does guarantee us your presence, your powerful presence, your peaceful presence, a joy that is beyond understanding. So we give you all the praise and thanks this morning as we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.